You don't get what you deserve in life, only what you manage to negotiate. So a real part of us starts to internalize the idea that if we're good, then good things will happen to us. And if we're bad, then bad things will happen to us. But the truth is, life doesn't work like that. Just because you're nice to your neighbors doesn't mean that people are going to be nice to you. Just because you're really nice to the girl doesn't mean that she's going to fancy you. Just because you are nice uh, to the shopping assistant, just because you're you come across well in the job interview doesn't mean that you're going to get the job. Why? Because getting results in life doesn't really depend on whether you're a good person or not. It depends on whether you've got the technical knowledge to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. If you want to find the right partner, you have to have the technical knowledge of how to appeal to the opposite sex. If you want the right job, you have to have the technical knowledge to come across well in an interview, be confident, present yourself in the best light and have the skills to do the job. So if things aren't going well for you in any area of your life, it's not because you're a bad person. If things are going well for you in any of your areas of your life, it's not necessarily because you're a good person. It's because you have the technical knowledge or don't have the technical knowledge to do what is required of you to thrive in that area. So if you don't do the right things, the right things won't happen to you. I'm the kind of person who writes for 30 minutes to an hour a day. I journal three pages every day to help me process my emotions. I'm the kind of person that eats a piece of fruit every day, that takes a walk every around the block every day. I'm the kind of person that goes to the gym twice a week. And i the kind of person who makes the bed before I leave the house. And what all of these things have in common is I wasn't the kind of person who did these things a year and a half ago. And I realized that that's a really profound change in me. You know, the change that I'm the kind of person who goes and does uh, pull-ups on, on, on a bar, you know, when, when, in between tasks when I'm in the hall. I, and there's lots of things that I'd like to be the kind of person who does. Like, I'd love to be the kind of person who gets up in the morning and does yoga for 15, 20 minutes. Hell, I'd love to be the kind of person who does a whole hour of yoga after I wake up. I'd love to be the kind of person who makes time to practice the piano every day and be the kind of person who records an album. And the great difference between me now and before I came became the kind of person that did all that other stuff that I told you I'm the kind of person who does, is I've got the experience of going from being the kind of person who doesn't write for 30 to 60 minutes a day to the kind of person who does. I've got, the kind, I've got experience of being the kind of person who doesn't go to the gym twice a week and becoming the kind of person who does. I've got the, I wasn't even the kind of person who took any physical exercise. And that is such a massive difference because what it means is I've got the mindset, I've got the belief that I can actually change myself and become the kind of person. Like, I've got a measurable, I'm a measurably different person from who I was two years ago because I'm the kind of person who does all these things that I wasn't the kind of person that I did. So what I want to say to you is I don't know what you want to do with your life, whether you want to write a book or start a business or um, if you want to record music or do art every day. There's something that your heart longs to do that you don't give yourself permission to do. And the chances are, if you're stuck, you probably are always or often thinking about getting things done. I need to finish that article so I can f send it away. I need to do this. I need to do that. And the truth is, it's not about doing the work. It's about becoming the kind of person, the kind of person that does the work. I don't worry about finishing the books that I'm working on when I write anymore. I used to always think I have to finish something. I don't think like that anymore. I mostly think about how can I get started today? Just even 20, 30 minutes. Can I zone off a time? Can I put my timer on and say, okay, I'm going to sit down for half an hour and do this thing that's going to contribute to my long-term well-being. And if I do this thing today and I do it tomorrow and I do it the day after that, then 
I'll become, in time, the kind of person who does this thing every day. And I'm bound to reach success. So don't think about getting finished. Not yet, anyway. When you've finished, I don't know, let's just take the example of you being an author like me. When you finish one book, you can think of how to get the next book finished. But don't think, when am I going to finish my book? Just build up a habit of doing that one thing every day. Don't try and change everything, because if you change, try and change everything, you won't change anything. Try and get one routine. Choose one thing that you think if you did every day for three weeks, you'd be the kind of person that does that every day. Maybe it'll take a bit longer than that. Once you've got that locked in, or once that starts to become easier for you, you can choose something else and start becoming the kind of person who does that every day. Thomas Carlyle said something like, the weakest creature by their focused effort can achieve something, but the strongest, most intelligent will achieve nothing by putting their energies out in every day. Your willpower is like an allowance. So what I suggest, what changed my life is that I focused on building up a routine, doing something that was difficult for me. When I was working on my book, Procrastination Annihilation, which you can get for free at beyourselfandloveit.com forward slash do it, I was working for it two, three hours a day, five days a week. But before I was able to work on it for two or three hours a day, five days a week, I had to first get the practice of writing half an hour a day, no matter what. It's time to think more positive if you want to be more positive. So when I'm walking down the street, I like to think, I'm strong, I'm powerful, I'm in control of the situation. Then someone else saying, you're strong, you're powerful, you're in control of the situation. Then someone saying it to someone else about me. He's strong, he's powerful, he's in control of the situation. And then by my name, Anthony's strong, Anthony's powerful, Anthony's in control of the situation. And if you've got something coming up, something big coming up that you want to be in a good state of mind for, you just put it in the future tense. I'll be strong, I'll be powerful, I'll be in control of the situation. You'll be strong, you'll be powerful, you'll be in control of the situation. And on you go. And of course, don't underestimate the power of the past tense. We hold a lot of negativity from the past and we often judge ourselves harshly for actions that we took in the past. So you can just say to yourself, I was strong, I was powerful, I was in control of the situation. And your unconscious will contextualize you in the here and now based on your previous experiences. It ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. That, my friends, is what gets results. The French philosopher Hippolyte Taine said, I have spoken to many philosophers and many cats, and I found that cats are infinitely wiser. So how would you like to live your life? Would you like to concentrate your mind and take very effective, precise action to attain a specific result? Or are you flailing around wildly? It's not passive to wait until you're focused and you know what you're doing before you take an action. If you can imagine a big sculpture or a large object, there's a certain point where if you put just the minimum amount of pressure, the whole thing would become crashing down. But if you went and pushed the object, you wouldn't have enough strength to push it over. So it ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. I'm reminded of the Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu who wrote, uh, well, he, philosopher is a funny word. I mean, maybe he was a mystic, maybe he was a Buddha, but he wrote a book called the Tao Te Ching and there's a concept of, in that called Wu Wei. Uh, I'm not sure the exact translation, but I like to call it the doing of not doing. And I, I got that turn of phrase from I think a Carlos Castaneda book and it's the idea that you just take the minimum but very precise action in order to get a result to be effective. You flow through life like a river. It takes the lowest path down the mountain. It takes the easy way but it's not passive. So you're just aware of the moment and you exert pressure in just the right place to get the result that you're looking for. When you come to a rock, you flow around it. When you come to a branch, you flow under it. When you come to a mound, you collect yourself until there's enough of yourself to flow easily over the top of it and not get too um, resistant. 
if you feel an emotion, feel the emotion, allow it to fall, th flow through you. It feels rubbish in the moment, but in the long term, you'll process that emotion quicker because your acceptance of that emotion. Think about the ways that you can be putting less effort to get more results, like the 80-20 rule. What is it that you do in your life that gets you the best results right now? Can you do more of that? And can you do less of the things that you're working away at, but you see little reward for? Can you flow like the river? Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the Bipcot No Government License. The Bipcot NoGov license allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to Bipcot.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. So today I am delighted to have back on the show Anthony Samaroff coming in from Scotland. And he is the author of his most recent ebook, Procrastination Annihilation. And, and also he's the host of Be Yourself and Love It podcast, which we will discuss as well. <clears throat> and he um his you can find the ebook at be yourself and love it dot com forward slash do it and so go ahead and check it out um and we will talk about uh the ebook what it's all about um all about procrastination and why it's such a deadly sin and uh his be your be yourself and love it podcast as well as he's got a little youtube channel where he um dishes out some motivational wisdom in short videos which you can also find links to from the ebook so download the ebook first you can get everything from there so uh, anthony thanks a lot for coming back on the show thank you so much for inviting me back on your show uh it's a real privilege no problem, <laughs> no problem. yeah i uh i see that you're a frequent guest on tom woods show and i'm like tom woods is not going to be the only one that can hog up <laughs> anthony's free time so <laughs> well, i'm competing with tom woods now okay <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter if mm. I win or not. It's just I'm competing. All right. <laughs> At least you're in the race, man. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, you got some good stuff to uh, to talk about, so I'm delighted to have you. So yeah, so discuss maybe why this topic interested you. You know, procrastination and productivity, and you know why you felt the need to to write about it. Well, I suffered tremendously from procrastination all through my twenties and for the beginning of my 30s and I guess I still occasionally suffer from it the thing is I do enough every day to feel like every day is a success um I get so much done compared to any time in the past now when I was suffering from procrastination I tried watching YouTube videos I tried reading books I never came across anything that really changed me in a meaningful way so when I finally conquered the problem to a large degree, it became intuitive to me to share what I'd learned to help other people overcome the problem. I mean, procrastination is not only a thief of human potential, it is so depressing to have dreams, have goals that you want to pursue and not be able to motivate yourself to do it. And it's completely endemic. I mean, I don't know if you went to college or university, but how many people did you know who only handed in their essays after doing them the last night or two? You know, it's <laughs> normal, you know. So there's a problem with this. You'd think that they just make the first year of uni university just to teach people all these kinds of skills, good organization, um, self-motivation and all these things before they did any formal study because – they know that this is a problem and yet, you know, it's just kind of ignored or people moralize and call people laziness, lazy. I don't really believe there's any such thing as laziness. I think that people deal with difficult emotions when it comes to pursuing their work, anxiety, they build things up in their head and they're avoiding those negative emotions. Um, they're, they're maybe actually working overtime on scaring themselves 
out of doing things rather than being lazy? I could say a lot. Well, basically, the short answer to your question, what would motivate me to write a book on overcoming procrastination? Suffering. <laughs> what else? You know, <laughs> and, and hoping to alleviate some of that suffering. You will not get a sense from reading this book that I'm some magic productivity machine that's always been like that you will really get a sense that i know what it's like to be a procrastinator and how difficult and soul destroying it is and i offer a really gentle method to help you or methods to help you learn to coach yourself through the difficulties it's a very practical book there's no like woo woo or magic or anything like that <laughs> it doesn't promise to take you from being a chronic procrastinator to a very productive person overnight you know it's it's like the book is going to teach you how to go to the gym for your conscientiousness it doesn't matter where you are at it doesn't matter how unconscientious you are just now or how conscientious you are because you can still improve it's just going to help you get a little bit better on average over time until you can do it and so far the feedback's been great people have been sending me emails going reading your book is like you've read my mind like how do you know <laughs> you know you you really know how i think and people are, people are saying it's helpful and funny i, I try to keep it light and humorous so that's my advert Get go to be yourself and love dot com forward slash do it and download it. So, so you're saying one of the uh, complimentary supplies that people need to buy in, in order to process the book is not a voodoo doll and a spell book and no. <laughs> well, I mean, you know what? It can't hurt. You know. Okay. You might as well. You might as well grab them too, especially if you buy it from my online store, which is <laughs> forward slash Buddha. Why not? <laughs> I, I don't know. Yes, I'm going to have to actually set up that online store before you put this video out. So I just make sure that I don't miss out on any. Right, right. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, the uh, the idea of uh, of procrastination is um, it's very interesting. I, I I read a part in your in your book where you said. Um, it's unfortunate that people. Well, so you said something like this: that that uh, not only is this um, not considered a serious problem, or maybe you're talking about emotions, not considered a serious problem, but it's also not even considered a problem. <laughs> mm. <laughs> that people recognize these things, that people can be tripped up and can fail before they even start mm. a task. You know, they can they can be um, intellectually self defeated. Mm. And and uh, I guess that's what writer's block is, isn't it? Like like right. once, you, once you actually start, you know, just things sometimes begin to flow just by the act yeah. of doing yeah. it, right? Go ahead. Well, that's one of the major challenges of overcoming procrastination, which is you don't feel like doing it, and you probably won't feel like doing it most times until you've been doing it for five ten minutes. And then I'd say, even if you can force yourself, force yourself, that's not the best method, but sometimes <laughs> it helps to do it for 10 minutes, 20, 25% of the time, you still won't feel like doing it. So there's that risk of, so uh, it's a lot to do with dealing with your emotions and getting experience. Like none of us were confident walking when we were toddlers, but now we don't even think about walking. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that you are not experienced in. And one may simply be, to sit down and write say you want to be a writer but you have to psych yourself up for a whole week to just do one session and you feel really bad the next day because you felt so good the night before you know getting the problem is not actually getting things finished the problem is getting started people focus on the end oh i need to write this i need to finish this all in this session or like and they get panicked and they, they race against themselves and try and get things done as quickly as possible so that because they know that their energy levels got going to wear out and if they don't finish it as quickly as possible they might not feel like it and then oh god there's another thing i said that i do that i've not done and it's three months you know and you get into a big build up of accumulation you get into a big accumulation of um unfinished projects and things that really represent 
failed dreams. They feel very emotionally heavy and they discourage you from being creative at all. I don't even want to get started on a new creative project because I've got so many that I've not finished yet. So like, I just won't even start. And you start to close up as a human being and, um, and you're not responsive to life. You're not creative because you're don't, you can't rely on yourself to follow through. And, uh, it's, it's bizarre. I mean, it's, this this is as you say like it's not considered a serious problem but it affects the whole personality structure over time being a procrastinator like your whole personality i mean i can't go out to the park for a walk because while i'm there as soon as i get there i'll be thinking oh all these things i need to do when Mm -hmm. i go home it's not even fun you know it affects you reading a book a reading a book is no longer oh i'm going to enjoy reading this book it's like I need to read this book so that I can get on to all the other books that I finished. Everything becomes a means to an end. And when it's a means to an end, it's a chore and you don't want to do it. So, yeah, the book offers many ramps to make it easier for you to get from where you are now to where you want to be. And in a very gentle way, it coaches you in coaching yourself to be self-compassionate and helpful to yourself you know there's a quote in the book that says now you're your own manager and your own employee you can be (laughs) the kind of manager that orders people around the office and everyone resents or you can be the kind of manager that brings out the best in his in his staff and uh, help yourself win employee of the month every month right yeah 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 the um yeah you know Procrastination is one thing that I honestly cannot relate to. Okay. <laughs> you know, because I, re- I I never had a problem really with mm-hmm. writing. I always, like specifically writing we'll talk about, I always loved to write. And mm-hmm. in high school, I would write a lot, of course, outside of school because they didn't really care to read my writing uh, in school. And then when I went to college, I was living by myself in a, um, in a studio apartment. Uh, I studied Chinese medicine and acupuncture. And uh, but I love to write about mm. philosophy, about morality, about history, about various things like that. And I would get in. I got into a routine. Like I'm, just, since the moment I was in high school, maybe middle school, even I, I'm a person of routine. Everybody in my life knows this. My parents, mm. my family, everybody knows I'm a man of routine. I do. I I uh, wake up. My room was never messy. Like you know, most kids' mm. teenage rooms is like clean your room. No, my parents never. Mm. Had to tell mm. me to clean my room. It was always yeah. everything. Bed was made. You know, I uh, I I woke up, got, went woke up early, went downstairs, read philosophy book, played practice piano, played some chess, mm. and and did some writing. And some and that, people are very envious of you. <laughs> that's, that's how I was. Thing. That's how I was. In, this. That's how I was as a teenager. And then and then I went to college and I continued that uh, that pattern. I would. I've basically. I I. I, I don't know if forced myself, but I just got into the routine of writing mm. one to two hours every single morning. Every, Wonderful. Every single morning. And and it's amazing when I look back on that time in my life and the things that I wrote, um, it's just amazing. I, 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 mm. I, I'm constantly shocked and amazed at the things that I was able to write um, when I was like 20, you know, mm. and, uh, and, how, and, and how it was such a... Um, a clear snapshot of my thoughts at that time, kind of like like a podcast right now is a snapshot of my thoughts. That writing with that time was a snapshot, and uh, and so yeah, it's so everything. I, I I applied that diligence and that perseverance to anything that I came across. Chess, I studied chess with the same amount of fervor and zeal mm-hmm. that I, I pursued writing and and piano i practiced piano feverishly because i of mm. course because i loved it as well but <laughs> you know and anything that i did so I, I i guess i'm just um i don't know disciplined is that is that the word maybe a conscientious Dri- dri- driven, discipline, driven driven oh yeah yes and well i think that people are driven unfortunately they get in their own way and yeah. those of us who are i mean i didn't arrive at writing two hours a day two three hours a day consistently until I wrote this book and I've always been a writer but I was very inconsistent when I was writing in this book I was doing two three hours a day um I was never able to do that before in fact and able to to be in order to be able to do that I first had to practice writing half an hour a day for at least six months but when I got into this book because 
what used to happen to me is I'd write for a long time sporadically and I couldn't discipline myself to write because I just made it up in my head to such a big thing. Mm, right. But once I got into a regular routine of just doing half an hour a day, you know, people, it doesn't matter what people want to do. They can start with 10 minutes, 20 minutes. The most important thing is to first build a routine. So if all you can do is five minutes, if all you can agree to is five minutes, that's good. Do that for like three, four weeks and then bump up. Then it'll be easy to bump it up or you will have already. So it's about making things easy for yourself. I don't really know how to, I, I mean, what what have been the major hangups in your life since definitely not procrastination or productivity <laughs> um major hang-ups um <laughs> none you're ma good ma at. making time making time for other people <laughs> right okay okay like oh so you, like, you were so busy with your own pursuits that you found it hard to find time to be more social I can't. I could be. Yeah, yeah. So one thing that you have to sacrifice if you're going to be individually productive is yeah your social life, <laughs> your friends going out, you know, mm. partying. Which I, I was never a partier anyway. I didn't really care about that stuff. Um, but uh, um, yeah. So so okay. Let, let me let me take a, another another part of your ebook. You talk about failure and uh, and this great uh, great quote by Wayne Gretzky: "You miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take." So true. And. And to me, that applies to, yeah, so many things in my life. I mean, chess, like some people, when they play chess, they have a fear of losing, right? right. And and they're so hard on themselves when they do lose. And um, and I think uh, this one website, chess.com, that I go on, it's like you never lose if you learn something. Exactly. Right? So, exactly. So, every, so I tell people, when I win, I'm not learning anything, right? Mm. I'm only learning well. things when I lose. <laughs> But I mean, the, a, a lot more can be learned from a loss than from a win. Sure. So go, go, ahead, go ahead. Yeah, it's all about getting experience. This is the thing. And this really is something brought forth from our education into our day to day conduct. So when you're at school, it's wrong to make a mistake. You get red crosses right, beside right, your mistakes. You right. get downgraded. Right. And mistakes are not seen, are seen as something to be feared. Whereas actually, if you really want to learn, you have to have the openness to fail. Because whatever you start, you suck at, you know, because you've not done it yet. You know, when you start <laughs> yes, playing exactly. chess, you suck at, you oh, suck yeah. ass. Big time, big time. Right? <laughs> I sucked at playing piano and guitar when I took them up, right? Yeah. There's loads of stuff that I still suck at. But, <laughs> you know, I've got good at some things. I, I was a piano tutor myself, and one of the things that you had to uncondition the kids from is like, you know, you need to hit the wrong keys to learn how to hit the right keys. Right. You can't be afraid mm -hmm. to hit the wrong keys. And so this is something that we need to cultivate within ourselves because school didn't help. So a general sense that, hey, it's okay like to just turn up to life and try things out and find out how to do things properly like mm -hmm. by doing them you don't need to get every decision right first time like just play around with it try things out you know mm -hmm. arrive as a explorer as a child as a someone who knows nothing mm -hmm. i don't know if this will work or not but try it out you know tune in with yourself what is it that you want to do and mm -hmm. um, be open and you know if you mess up you you learn something and i i notice that all the time i've really retrained my m mental speak in that respect like anytime i do something wrong I'm, I'm always noticing in my thoughts i'm thinking oh well it's okay because i'll know what to do next time like you know, if I'm somewhere and I got off the bus at the wrong place or I or anything like that, it doesn't really matter what. But I always notice that I've got a voice in my head saying, OK, well, I know next time, which is, yeah, pretty revolutionary compared to where I was at 10 years ago, where I might have just been like, you idiot, why don't you always do right, this? Right. Yeah, there's a good to make there's a, there's a great movie. Um, so but so I play piano too, and I actually also teach piano. I'm sure you have more students than me, but <laughs> but no, I, I, I don't teach anymore. I'm oh, retired. Don't. 
No, I do, I'm just a counselor and coach now. Oh, cool, cool. Okay, yeah. all right. I mean, I mean, I, I had a few, I have a few students. I'm still looking for more students actually, but but uh, I love piano and I started playing when I was 12, and uh, completely driven, passionate, self motivated. I basically taught myself, even though I did have teachers, but you know they were kind of slow, and I wanted to learn like really quickly. I would practice. So this is how driven I was. 12 years old, I would get up, wake up at like four in the morning, practice one hour of piano before school when everyone's most likely sleeping mm -hmm. and then i would get home from school practice two more hours mm -hmm. every single day monday through friday yeah you must have excelled <laughs> i loved it and um, wonderful and so i remember this movie um immortal beloved i'm sure you saw it uh, about beethoven uh, beethoven's life and um and one one uh, quote he said that really stuck with me was uh to play a wrong note is insignificant to play without passion is unforgivable. Right. 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 <laughs> and that really stuck with me because yeah. I I was the type of person as a piano player, I'm just like chess, you know. I saw yeah. difficult difficult things or difficult pieces as a challenge, not mm. an obstacle, just a challenge. Mm. Like like I don't know this piece yet, but I want to learn it because it sounds cool and I want to learn it and I'm going to do whatever it takes, however much mm. I need to practice. I'm going to learn this piece. Even if my teacher says that piece is too hard, you should not learn it. <laughs> I'm probably mm. I, I'm I'm going to even take that bit of advice mm. uh, as more of a challenge to learn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so good for you, man. What a great I, attitude. Yeah. So that, so that's definitely how I was, and um, yeah, and, and basically I learned so many pieces uh, that uh, uh, that I still know to this day uh, when I was when I was twelve and thirteen that I uh, just kept going 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 like yeah. So I was like nonstop. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and what are your favorites? <sighs> um, my favorites. Whew. Well, the very first, the very first pieces when I first started learning, I would say, I guess those were my favorites. Uh, Beethoven sonata. So the Moonlight Sonata, all three movements. The Pathetic mm. Sonata, all three movements. Oh, great piece. The, the Appassionata Sonata, all three movements. Um, what else? Um, oh yeah, I learned Hungarian Rhapsody. List. Uh, number two, mm -hmm. I learned the Hungarian Rhapsody. Number twelve, the <laughs> so, and then a bunch of Chopin nocturnes, and then and then Schumann, and then oh the Schubert. I don't know if you know the four impromptus, yeah. the four impromptus. That's beautiful. Uh, and actually, the third impromptu, which is a very uh, melodious, melancholic uh, piece, mm. um, my great aunt from Australia, who's probably in her eighties right now. When she first heard me play that, I think it was probably like, I don't know, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, she first heard me play that, and she's a lover of classical music and piano music. Mm -hmm. She came up to me and she said, um, I want you to play that for my mm -hmm. funeral. Uh, Can you imagine that? And I was like yeah, blown wonderful. away by that. I'm like, wow. Oh, my God. Wow. So, so yeah. Yeah, I, I love, yeah, I love, uh, yeah, especially like um, classical, Baroque, classical, romantic. Mm. That's like my favorite, my favorite time periods. Mm. I don't really do much of the blues or the jazz or the modern. Mm. I'm not really that kind of guy. Mm. So, so what about you? What, what's your focus with piano? Well, I don't get much chance to play classical music anymore. So uh, it just takes too long to learn and I don't have the time for it at the moment. But I'm meaning to make the time to practice for an hour a day a little further down the, the year when I'm done promoting ebooks. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'll maybe be able to work it into my schedule. But yeah, I loved playing uh, Beethoven sonatas. Uh, right now, it's mostly rock and pop that I play if I play because it takes a lot less time to learn stuff and uh -huh. It's easy under my fingers. I love to play Queen. I like to play Billy Joel. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, just piano piano driven rock music okay. is fun to play so yeah I played do a bit of that and um, every now and then I get a little cheeky bit of Beethoven in there or, or something like that <laughs> yeah the uh, I think the most modern thing that I know is uh, is Paul Anka You Are My Destiny it's an, mm. it's an oldie I think from the 50s or 60s <laughs> right and the only reason that I learned that was because I got a a free piano. I think I was probably like 15 years old, 16 years old. This woman, uh, I think she was in her 60s. She's like, she was advertising. I'm I'm giving away my piano to somebody who shows that they, you know, love piano and would appreciate it. And so I went to her house. I played the first movement mm -hmm. of the Moonlight Sonata for her, and she completely fell in love with it. She was like, the mm -hmm. piano is yours. <laughs> and, Lovely. And inside, inside, this, yeah, inside the seat of the piano was various music 
uh, and one of them was "You Are My Destiny," and I just had wow. it. It just had it on the music stand, you know, just right. there, and I would just practice it, you know, not really intending to learn it right. or memorize it, because for me, when I play a piece, I only consider it done until I memorize it, right? And right. so, and so, I just kept looking at it, glancing at it every once in a while, every time I would play. And I just memorized it like accidentally. I just right. <laughs> I just learned it and memorized it. <laughs> and that's one of my one of my father's favorite pieces. Like when he whenever, whenever my father was drunk, he like, "Play, you are my destiny." <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so um so yeah so, I, and you also have in here um the Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, mm. and and I thought that was a that's a it's a very interesting thing to put in here. Uh, because I, I often refer to that as well when when you you know this this actually to me relates to economics like like mm. why do people act the way they do you know and and if you realize you know what what people need to be to feel happy at the most base level right and if they mm. don't have that if they're lacking something of the most basic mm. thing you know um then they're gonna seek out that like like let's mm. say um, I don't know security from family. Like I don't know, they grew up. Uh, I don't know, just terrible family. Maybe divorce. Maybe just fighting. You know, their parents and everything, and and, and all their lives they're seeking security. Mm. You know that that to me, for sure, that's a wonderful way to understand uh, why people behave the way they do. So, so so why did mm. you put it in? Well, the reason why I put it in is I think it's relevant to procrastination because if you understand Maslow's hierarchy of needs, at the bottom is our physiological needs, you know, to eat, pee, poo, <laughs> etc. All the things that you breathe, all the things you need to be alive. But after that is the need for security. And Maslow posits that until you've met these most basic needs, you're not so interested in creativity. You're not so interested so, uh, in pursuing your goals and self-actualization and things like that. So I think this is relevant to procrastination because you need to feel secure pursuing your goals. And some people who are anxious find it really, really difficult to sit down to write because, oh, it's stressful for whatever reason. Maybe they got chastised by their parents or in school uh, or, or, or people were perfectionists around them, or any any reason. So, one of the reasons why people might procrastinate is because the need for security comes before the need for creativity. And this would also explain, this is just my hypothesis, why some people who procrastinate are very quick to work for several hours the night before a deadline. Why? Because at that point it becomes more secure to not procrastinate than to procrastinate. So <laughs> I felt like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs lent some usefulness as a model to explain why we behave the way we do and how we can aid ourselves, which is not by like calling yourself a bad person and lazy and um, oh, I'm such a whatever you say to yourself when you're procrastinating, but actually by befriending yourself and becoming a good coach for yourself. Not overnight, you don't expect you to go like that, but just a little bit better every day. And it gives you practices, little things that you can take at whatever level you're at and adapt your practice to your own level to get a little bit better, a little bit more productive, on average, over time. Yeah, yeah. The uh, you mentioned perfection is per, being a perfectionist, and mm. uh, I always considered myself to be a perfectionist. Um, but I think there's also a um, the idea of um, perf um, per perfectionist paralysis, where people right. are so much for perfectionist, they they yes. they just can't do anything because it has to be perfect, right? And uh, and I'm not like that. I, I you know I consider mm. myself a perfectionist. But that motivates me to just do it, yes. continue doing it to improve and get better and better. Um, so I, I find to me it's more of a motivator. Um, so so yeah. So that's uh, I, I thought that's an interesting uh, idea. Go ahead. Yeah, I appreciate that, and uh, you're very fortunate. Again, a lot of us are crippled right. at times by perfectionist paralysis. And what I say in the book as well is like, you can't actually lower your standards because they're part of who you are. You know, the you you know, the point is not to stop 
having high standards. The point is to find a way to gradually get better and better so that you can meet your own standards, you know, so that you so that people feel the way that you do. So, yeah, of course, you can say to yourself, just just do it as practice and you can try and be kinder to yourself. But ultimately, if you take up an art, whether it's playing the piano or writing like you and I, or whether it's art or writing theater or whatever it is, the reason why people want to be creative is because they've got good taste and they've seen good media and they've seen bad media and they've seen good art and they've seen bad art and they know what they like and they want to do stuff. They want to do good stuff. But what they're going to be confronted with is that when they start, they suck. Mm. Everyone does. Because it's <laughs> going to take you a bunch of time to get enough practice to be as good as to be able to create work that's as good as the work that you want to create. And the section on perfectionism gives you some tools to begin to do that. And yeah, so it's like, for example, I've been writing for a long time, but I, but the tone, this book is in many ways the greatest thing I've ever written because it's so nice and easy to read. It speaks it reads like I'm speaking to you, like I'm having a chat with you. It mm-hmm. just sounds like a chat. Yeah. And it took me 15 years to be able to write that simply. You know, if you looked at my writing five, six, seven years ago, it was like very big, long sentences, very b- verbose. And I was always trying to simplify it, but I found it so difficult. But the experience has helped me learn to simplify and simplify. So, for example... I'm very, very pleased with the standard of writing in this book as a perfectionist. You know, I meet my own standards with this book. I'm very pleased with it. I don't mean to toot my own horn, but (laughs) do you know know what I mean? I'm just really, really, really proud proud of it. Um, And because I feel like if you've never heard of me before, if this is the first time you've heard me and you read this book or if someone sends it to you, I feel like you would know me. It takes two hours to read the book. It's a short book. But my personality comes through in the writing. My sense of humor comes through in the writing. And the the funny thing is it looks, it reads very easily, but it's very hard and takes a lot of experience to be able to write something that reads that easily. So that's just the thing. You know, it takes time to cultivate your craft and you need to find ways to make that time pleasurable instead of, just frustrating for some people do some people do yeah yeah so, so so two things to me come to mind when i think of uh you know if somebody asks me how do i master a craft and uh, you know whether it's writing or chess or piano and and i would say number one just do it <laughs> do it <laughs> do as much of it as you can because yeah. you know that's how you that's how you just develop your your voice you know and your writing style or, or whatever your chess style and the other thing is to um, read works of the great mm. writers, or watch sure. watch the great chess master. You know, examine great chess games, or yeah. or or you know, watch great pianists and how they play. Mm. You know, that's definitely because um, because how do you know what good writing is? Mm. <laughs> you know, how do we get a exactly. sense of what good writing is yeah. if, if we don't examine the great writers? And and I remember uh, Stefan Mann, you mentioned recently to, uh, this this idea that um, Shakespeare. Um, his like he's considered like the most famous playwright in history, and he, you know he's well well renowned, respected, and all that. And yet, only twenty percent, I think, of his plays are mm. regularly performed. <laughs> today. Probably, probably. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's Some like the, the most obscure. accomplished playwright yeah. only has twenty percent of his work performed. So, so, <laughs> so failure is all around us. Failure is the default. You know, just mm. like just like you know. Poverty is the default. Success yeah. is not. <laughs> Success mm. happens to those people that actively work to improve themselves and to struggle and and get better. And over time, you know, those people, uh, you know, what, what do they say? The uh, the uh, the the ten year overnight success. <laughs> is that right. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Great. And that's that that that's it. Ten year overnight success because <laughs> nothing works so well above the ground unless it's working well below the ground. Right. When you plant an apple tree, 
you need to go out and water that apple tree and give it nice soil and fertilizer and put a little cane beside it so it doesn't blow over from the wind, limit the environmental toxins. And you do that for years and you get no apples. But then all of a sudden, <laughs> one spring, yeah. suddenly you've got apples. So, yeah, it's just one of these things like it takes time and you need, yeah, you need good mindsets to take into that time and I think one great thing about the book is it's worth reading my book and then if you're struggling with procrastination keep on reading it like a few days every day or two like because it's short and you reinforce the ideas and it'll help you stay in a positive frame of mind and coach yourself because when you're in that phase you're weeding the garden you have to weed the garden before you plant flowers because if you don't weed the garden, mm. then the flowers won't grow. Mm. Mm. Uh, you're going, you're weeding and weeding and you're working. And you're like, oh, how long is this going to take? Like some people are. And you're like, this is taking forever. I've been weeding the garden. When do I get flowers? And the, But you have to you have to be able to persist through that roller coaster. And you've got to show yourself that you've got what it takes. And a really great way is to speak to people who've done what you want to do so mm -hmm. that you actually have a realistic view oh, yeah. of how long it takes, you know, to get from where you are to where you want to be. Yeah, there's another great quote uh, that you wrote in here in your book, which is, um, it's, not about, it's not about what you do, but how you do it, right? Mm. And, and I think uh, it, it's so important. That's such an important concept that, about mindset, right? And I'm going to mm. tie that into the idea of unschooling, right? When, mm. Because because so many people have this idea that p kids should go to school because they need to learn these specific mm. things to be successes in life. Mm. And what I tell those people is that no, there are mm. there isn't any specific bit of bits mm. of information that children need to learn to be successful. That's not you've missed the whole point. <laughs> you know, right. you know, children are not like computers that you just program them and then th they're going to function well. No, <laughs> mm. they're human beings. They have free will. They have desires. They have weaknesses. Mm. They have you know character defects. And so, to me, the whole idea of raising kids and unschooling is if I can instill a love of learning. Yes. In the child, you know. Then you don't a, have to worry. A passion for acquiring information, it doesn't matter what they do, they're going to be mm. a success. They're going to be self-driven, motivated. Sure. You know, you don't need, you know, it's like the difference between whipping somebody to do something mm -hmm. and then paying them to do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, sure. if, if people have a, have a, have a motivation, the self inner, an inner flame that's yeah. burning, then, then they don't need anybody telling them yeah. to do anything. They're just going to go For out sure. there and do stuff and be productive. Yeah. Yeah. And because they're passionate, they'll get good at whatever they do. And because they're good at it, they'll do just fine. You know, and this is, if we didn't get that, if our environment did not provide that for us, then we need to learn how to provide it for ourselves as adults and one way you could do that is get my free book procrastination annihilation at be yourself and love it.com forward slash do it yes yes please uh everybody go out and read this book it's wonderful as he said it's just like he's talking to you it's it's um it's not like uh, reading human action although you guys can try to read that too <laughs> Good book. oh yeah have you read it no, I've read theory and history. Okay, yeah, I've, I've not read it either. Um, uh, I don't know if I will, but uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it sounds like an awesome book. Um, but I mean, I like I love reading about you know those economic theories just like you. Yeah, I mean, economic me economics nerd just like you. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh... I'm a total economics nerd. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, I mean, there's even a lot of overlap with with economics and this. You know, economics to me is again about understanding human behavior. You know, why That's people right. why people behave the way they do. And and if you ask, um, you know, if you ask a communist, they say because it's, you know evil capitalists are exploiting them. Eh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> or or if you ask a feminist, well, why are they behave? Well, because the patriarchy is. Nah, I don't think it doesn't really comport with that i don't think you're mm. explaining everything <laughs> right so everybody everybody's got their own um their own idea but i think uh, what i love about um you know specifically Austrian economics is it's it's not really like um 
assigning a a, a slant like a, a a negative mm-hmm. anger slant like all these things are like you know this this group is oppressing that group and this group is oppressing no no to me it's more just like you know these people the producers produce things because they want to satisfy the consumers and mm-hmm. and the consumers are searching for ways to get their needs satisfied mm-hmm. and it's a, it's a voluntary interaction equal exchange and oh you know that really makes sense nobody mm-hmm. nobody's oppressing anybody it's it's kind of <laughs> You know that mm. it, yeah, it just it just falls into place when you when you look at it that way to me. Yeah, it's. Uh, I lived in a depressing world when I was a socialist because I go into a supermarket and think, oh, like this big corporation like is destroying the local economy and look at all these right. th- things from bad. They're probably exploiting the farmers. That whereas now I go in and I'm like. like Wow! Look at all this stuff from all over the world. Isn't it amazing? You know, yeah. it helps you become more optimistic when you see the world through a pro-free market lens. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and I'll take another quote from your book, which is, um, um, if if taking a mile a mile per mile, life is a trial, right? And inch by inch, life's a cinch. <laughs> right. And, and you and you said you're yeah. you're mixing your what did you say you're mixing your imperial metrics? imperial units with. <laughs> my metric units because <laughs> right. i think i first heard that uh, like yard by yard life oh, is hard I inch see, by see. inch life's a cinch but i actually prefer <laughs> mile by mile life's a trial inch by inch life's a cinch <laughs> so just take it baby steps yes, you don't need to yes. be anywhere you don't need to be anywhere other than where you're at mm-hmm. and you don't need to get where you're going anywhere quicker than you can you just focus on your next step and your next step and you will be just fine the big challenge is retraining yourself to just look at next steps when you're used to looking at the destination yeah yeah that's that's so important like so many people focus like i i need to get there i need to learn this piece i need to get this book written um, mm. But I, I think you can be amazed at how much you get done when you just say to yourself, you give yourself a reasonable goal, mm. you know, say, I'm going to write for 30 minutes a day. I'm going to, you yeah. know, bite sized chunks, right? That's perfect because this is the pro. This is one of the problems that people like writers get into, which is like, oh, I need to finish this book, which means they're trying to do two and three hours at a time, mm. even though they've not got the psychological capacity to do it. And the only thing is trying to get it finished, which means that the whole experience is stressful and unpleasant. They're not actually enjoying writing because they've got a goal to get it finished. Whereas if you do have a discipline of writing for, say, 30 minutes a day, it doesn't matter whether it's finished or not at the end of your sitting, you just do it. It's just something that you do. And eventually, lo and behold, the book's finished. Mm. Wow, it's finished. (laughs) Why? Because you were disciplined and you weren't thinking. You weren't just thinking about the end. You made it into a practice. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? You're just right. You know, yeah, yeah. You, you you incorporated into your being basically. It's not something yes. like I have to do this. It's just like okay, yeah, it's it's part of my day. Of, it's, it's part yeah, of, <laughs> this is one of these things that I do. <laughs> it's one of these things that I do. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So before we go, let's let's discuss your your podcast. Be yourself and love it. I'm sure there's a lot of overlap between that and uh, the book. So yeah. So what's that all about? Well, be yourself and love it podcast is something that I launched last year to collect together resources featuring me either interviewing other people or being interviewed by other people or a a few of them are solo shows but you know i used to do a youtube channel called the progressive parent youtube channel and then i had another channel that i had videos on and i wanted to have i wanted to make new interviews I knew that. And also I was appearing on other people's shows. So my media appearances were all over the place. So what I wanted to do is build up a stream where everything, where people could find my stuff all in the one place. So I've got a whole backlog of bits and pieces from all over the place. And I put one out a week and sometimes I put new material out. Recently I've done a few interviews, uh, one with a, um, relationship intimacy and sex coach called I think sexual empowerment you, that was a really great conversation we've got podcast episodes on authentic relationships how to choose the right partner um, 
a lot of relationship stuff, a lot of stuff on productivity, a lot of stuff on health, all the kinds of things that, you know, meet the title, all tools to help you be yourself and love it because it's not enough to be yourself if you hate it. Hmm. So be yourself and love it. Don't just be yourself. That's kind of the message of the podcast. And uh, it gives you, it's, I've always aimed to be very practical with it. It's not too much philosophy. It is infotainment. Of course, as a podcast has to be entertaining. But it's also practical. I put out stuff that people can use. So subscribe on iTunes. Check it out. I think you'll like it. If you like, if you like this, you'll like that. Of course, in between listening to peaceful anarchism, you know, <laughs> do, do, naturally, <laughs> naturally, you get your priorities straight. <laughs> Everything other than these two shows can get bumped to the end of the queue. But these two, you definitely need to, to exactly. listen to. On the top of the list, uh, <laughs> yeah, relationships. That's uh, that's excellent. I, um, yeah, that's uh, that's so important. You know, um, how how we relate to one another. I think, um, yeah, it's, it's it's such an important thing to focus on. You know, people. So many people have have problems. You know, like like, like it's kind of easy to. Um, I guess live alone and do things by yourself, but but once you add someone else into the mix, things get a little more dicey, a little more complicated. You know, you gotta think about them, and is this gonna anger them, hurt their feelings? You gotta think about, you know, what what are they, you know, what's on their mind? So it's it's, it's it really, um, you know, it adds some complexity, and of course, when you add kids to that, <laughs> the complexity just whew, exponentially yeah. compounds. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, you have to have good communication skills because every relationship has conflicts, right. and when you get into a conflict. Your emotions rise up. You don't think as clearly. So it's very good to have certain communication skills practiced. And these are not taught in school. And if you didn't see your parents do them, mm. then how would you have learned them? Right. So I definitely recommend the podcast episodes on communication skills. We've got one called... Um, ah. Where am I? Yeah. Breaking out of relationship cycles, authentic relationships, excellent communication skills with Pete Gerlach and Anthony Samaroff. Um, she dumped me like trash. That's a popular episode. That's my <laughs> a phone in show. Um, yeah, all sorts of stuff. I think uh, another one was good. Uh, understanding stress, defensiveness, and fight or flight response or freeze responses. The, these are some of the titles of episodes that relate to relationships if that's something that people are interested in i'm really proud of it actually um we're, i'm at about 30 episodes or coming up to about 30 episodes now so um and they'll they come out once a week so i won't overload you <laughs> yeah that's that's great i um you know i also think that uh you know raising kids you you learn a lot about you know how do you relate to another human being because mm. because so many people look at kids like you know realistically they're not human beings that's how they look mm. at them that's how they raise them and it's unfortunate because i think you lose on a wonderful opportunity um to connect with a human being who you know happens to be much younger and smaller but still a human being that that needs to be talked to kindly lovingly compassionately and and needs to be taught really it needs to be taught reasoning skills and the only way that you that they can acquire that like, like you mm. said is from the parents yeah. or they're going to get it from somewhere else right For and, sure. and so if they can get it from you as a parent all the better yeah you're setting them up at an advantage and in order to get it from you you have to have them right if you don't got them you can't model them <laughs> and children learn the most from how their parents are not what their parents say right you know how they are so there's quite a few podcasts on there on parenting as well on peaceful parenting and and interesting constructive approaches to solving problems in the family yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. I saw. I saw a great uh, conversation recently. Stefan Molyneux did about um, this guy called in. He's like, I listen to your show. I love peaceful parenting. I, I understand why it's so important. But I spank my child because I don't understand. I don't know what what else I can do. They're not child. My child's not mm. listening to me. A four year old child, right? Child's not listening to me. Mm. W what do I do, right? And 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 what what I thought it was amazing with the conversation was that once you automatically rule out the possibility mm. of physical punishment of corporal punishment you say this is not even an option 
I'm not even going to yeah, think about yeah. doing this. Then all of a sudden, so you're many forced. possibilities come up that you're like, oh, I could have done that. I could have said that. So, Go ahead. And I, even though I don't have children of my own, I saw that firsthand when I was volunteering as a classroom assistant. Mm. Very many times they put me with some of the more difficult children mm. that had learning difficulties because that's funny because I was a volunteer but they saw that I had skills when it came to kids and interesting because a couple of times I'd have a kid basically freak out or start going nuts and because I don't really believe in punishment or using too much authority with kids unless it's absolutely necessary um, then I kind of froze up at first because it's like I don't even know how to handle this but because I didn't have that as an option I didn't have right I'm going to give you a punishment exercise I never would have said that because mm. I know that would destroy my relationship with the child and mm. make them more difficult in the future right. I had to think on my feet and because I had to think on my feet I'd come up with ingenious solutions to problems that I never would have thought of before yeah yeah right. yeah yeah it's, it's really yeah, it's so important. So, so the way the way that we treat our friends, the way that we treat our loved ones, um, it definitely reflects on the way that we treat our our kids. You know, mm. um, you know, we we definitely all you know have differing amounts of physical strength, right? Mm. <laughs> but that doesn't mean anything really if you're trying to you know be someone's friend. You know, mm. you got to treat them as an equal, right? You know, just mm. like a spouse, you got to treat them as an equal or a loved one. Um, and, and I would argue the same thing with a child. Treat them very much like an equal. I, I say I would rather my child look at me as a friend, as a confidant, as a trusted mm. ally yeah. than as yeah. a superior or an authority figure yeah. that they must bow down to and obey just because I'm bigger, older, and stronger. Sure. Yeah, because if you've got that trust, then they're going to come to you for counsel. And when you give them advice, they're not going to think, oh, why is yours telling me what to do? Because they've got a strong bond with you. They see you as an elder, someone that's got more information and experience than them. And they will see you as a resource, not as a authority figure of the likes. You know, we've seen from the stereotypes, you know, the schoolmaster and Pink Floyd's The Wall mm, or, uh, right. <laughs> or, you know, or something like that, you know. Yes, yes. So, um, yeah. So, definitely, um, yeah. Relationships is like, like when I when I talk to people, I I oftentimes um, ask them questions about about their you know their family history and the relationships and their kids and how they relate. I, I kind of that's something that I actually do enjoy talking to people about is is how do you relate to your kids and and what are some difficulties you have with your kids and you know what have you tried and you know maybe you should try this and 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 sometimes you know just talking about your problems with somebody you you encounter solutions you think of solutions <laughs> just by talking just by having an open ear you know and and i think when i meet new people and i make friends i think i uh i try to be that open ear and i, and I try to hear out their problems um because maybe perhaps many times they don't even have a chance to tell someone their problems other than maybe their spouse which you know it's like that's that's you, you, that you, that's expected. You tell your spouse your problems, right? But uh, but I, I like to be a, a friend in that way as well. You know, you can talk about mm. your problem. It's so important. Mm. People, um, and, and people love to talk about it. Like once you mm. give them a chance to talk mm. about it, they just they're like overflowing with yeah. problems. Like yeah. like what about this? You know? Yeah, yeah. And a lot of the time, you don't need to solve it for them. You no. just need to give them no. high quality attention. And if you're really good at giving people attention without interrupting or putting your own interpretations on it, and they feel very well understood by you, then they're very likely to listen to your advice. And a lot of the time, bet what's much better than giving advice is sharing your own experience and say, right. well, this once happened to me. And because cause people don't, necessarily like being given advice mm. and they don't when they're sharing something personal the more emotional they are the less ready they are to hear advice but if you keep on listening and maybe reflect back what you're hearing see if you can paraphrase what you've heard put it in your own words so you're saying you're feeling upset because x y and z happened or oh that sounds really infuriating then the more people talk and feel understood by you the more their emotion goes down and down and down and down and down and finally when it goes to zero they like kind of look at you expectingly and then if you've got some advice they're more likely to listen to it but if you skip the part where you let them vent then they're less receptive because they're so desperate to 
be understood that they're not ready to take on new information. So this is just having an awareness of where people are at emotionally and how appropriately to respond to their level of emotion. Yeah, you know, what's what's the, one of the most common um, phrases or feedback that I get when I talk to people, you know, friends, or, or, or <laughs> oftentimes people I just meet, right? They, mm. they start talking to me and then they're saying stuff and then I hear and then I hear them say, I don't even know why I'm telling you all this, but yeah. I am. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> that that you, so and, you and me both, we have that kind of, <laughs> we have the kind of personality that, um, that, inspires people to share their deepest darkest with us <laughs> yeah you know what I, maybe i just i i don't i don't really care you probably what... come across as non-judgmental maybe that and, and also i feel like i don't care what is like politically incorrect to ask mm. people <laughs> yeah i'm bold just ask them anyway. i'm bold i'm rash maybe some people would say uh and, and when i ask them like we're in social situations they say me and my wife or me and family and i ask a question to somebody he's like daniel why are you asking that question <laughs> but i'm, I'm like well can, because i'm curious yeah i could be very direct and straight to the point like i just ask the if i feel like the question is in my mind i ask mm. it and uh i don't know is that no filter i don't know if that's no filter but sometimes um yeah, and people respond, you know, they're like, oh, wow, yeah. you wanted to know that? Wow, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so it seems like you and I are uh, have, have similar, <laughs> similar relationships. Mm. And, and yeah, so I, um, I, I make a lot of friends pretty easily. Mm. And, uh, and actually growing up when I was in high school, um, most of my friends were girls because I, right. just, I just felt more comfortable around um mm. girls and women because they seem to be more emotionally available mm. and will open up to me more easily and not necessarily so with the guys um mm. you know and, and also i wasn't really interested in the stuff the guys were interested mm. in you know chess and piano and philosophy right. eh, that's, i don't know and so um and so yeah, yeah. And, and even now even to this day I am, for the most part, I I'm with my you know kids doing the homeschooling, and I hang out with mostly homeschooling mothers. I am like right. oftentimes the only father there, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> and, and, and 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 if you look at it from the outside, it's like oh that that seems weird, but but now it's like just seems normal and natural. So, <laughs> yeah, you prefer the company of women. You know, I, I, they they seem to have better conversations for the most part. You know, mm. um, yeah, more more down to earth and more real. Mm. And uh, you know, of course, depends on what kind of women. You know, so mm. we, uh, we we don't have many feminists in our group, <laughs> but most of them are pretty even keeled and un, and reasonable mm. and rational. So mm. so yeah, we get along quite well. Um, but uh, but yeah, so before we go, please, um, can you reiterate? your links and how people can get the book if they want to get it great well i would suggest you go to be yourself and love it.com forward slash do it and download my free ebook procrastination annihilation and the ebook is the link to where you can find my youtube channel where i put little self-help videos out five to ten minutes long and and also to Be Yourself and Love It podcast, which you can find on iTunes and very other um, podcast apps. Uh, it's also on SoundCloud. So, yeah, it's a good podcast. If you're a podcast lover, I suggest you try two or three episodes of it. And if you like it, keep on listening. Yes, please go out, get this book. Um, the please. more the more we have productive individuals in our society, yeah. the, the more uh, the more we have content, you know, and fulfilled individuals. I think the uh, the, the more the happier and the, and the, and, the, and and more prosperity will reign <laughs> on our yeah. Earth. And also, yeah. you know, the more people are creating stuff, the more cool stuff there is for us to enjoy. Right. So right. that there's you know we all rise together. We all stand to benefit from oh, yeah. other people. Uh, accomplishing their goals and their passions so if you download the book don't be afraid to send to email it to as many people as you want you know it's free just give it away i mean <laughs> i wrote it for people to benefit from it not for it to sit in the back annals of the internet so don't be afraid to send it to anyone you think it would help yeah a great a great quote that i like is um is the rising tide raises all boats that's right. All right. That's and, right. And and so uh, that's why I tell people when when we spread information, when we educate people, you know, that's why I love doing this podcast and this YouTube channel, 
because I, I'm educating people and in interviewing fascinating people like you, I'm, I'm exposing oh, other people to, to, to cool people <laughs> that you might not otherwise have known about. Mm-hmm. So, um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. So before we go, I know I asked you a, a uh, I asked you a, a, a quote, the last interview, and I'm sure the quote is different for this. So what would you say is your favorite quote from this book or pertaining to this topic? The quote is by Thomas Carlyle, the weakest living creature by concentrating his powers on a single object can accomplish something. The strongest by dispensing his over many may fail to accomplish anything. And that's a relevant quote pertaining to the book Hmm. because it helps you build up useful practices by concentrating your energy on one thing at a time until that thing becomes second nature to you and then you can use that willpower allowance your daily allowance of willpower to build a second habit and so forth so yeah i definitely recommend it it's free be yourself and love it.com forward slash do it i've said it enough times and <laughs> yeah, i really hope you'll enjoy my free ebook oh that's and yeah, that'll yeah, you, yeah that's actually that'll you, go ahead, go ahead. That'll help you achieve your goals. Yeah, yeah. No, to me that that reminds me of of um, the idea that you know time is finite, right? Our our mm-hmm. you know resources are finite, in, um, and desires are infinite, right? Mm-hmm. So we have all these things that we want to do, right? But we have a certain amount of time in the day, a certain amount of free time in the day in which to do a certain amount of time to read books, a certain amount of time to you know watch you know tutorials and youtube videos and listen to podcasts and so like certain in different stages of my life you know i had an insatiable desire for piano and just just devouring and practicing and chess devouring and and playing chess and then learning about economics devouring various economics books uh on uh, on economics on history on on all these things on on the monetary system and uh and yeah so so yeah, basically by concentrating your efforts and, and focus, focusing like a laser <laughs> on whatever it is you want to learn, yeah, that's that that's the that's a measure of success. So awesome, awesome conversation. Thank you very much, Anthony, for coming on the show. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you for having me for a second time. I wasn't so appalling the first time that you were put off, but from inviting <laughs> me back. No, not so, not so appalling at all. So, <laughs> wonderful conversation. Hope you all enjoyed Great it. Time. So, um, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Take care. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.